of the time I'm going to take up, I do want to turn things over to Clara Brillenberg. I wanted to say, say a special thanks for Clara and Christy Edwards, who are the co-chairs of the Women in International Law Interest Group. We're very pleased with the effort that they put into planning this, and as you can tell from the turnout, it's a very popular event, and I will leave things to our panel now. Thank you and welcome here on, on an early Tuesday morning. Uh, we know that if you've made it here, you are very eager to uh, find out what your future holds in international law. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome the audience and also welcome the speakers for coming out today and sharing their experience and kind of removing the curtain and seeing the great wizard behind it. Um, and talking about how they found what it is that they're interested in and what their passion was in international law. And once they figured out what it was, uh, how they got there. Um, which for everyone is always a different story. Um, so it's good to hear the stories behind um, the trajectory. Um, so first of all, we have uh, Jessica Lindgren who is general counsel at Blue Star Strategies and she has come to the private sector through, uh, through the uh, public sector as well as working in a law firm. So she can kind of give you a taste of a little bit of everything. Um, before she was at Blue Star, she was the director and senior vice president at Breast Care, uh, which is a large US human services company. Um, but she began at, uh, at a law firm like many of us and um, spent much time at the International Labor Organization which also took her to the, um, the World Bank and the UN. So she comes from a very varied perspective. And during her free time, she decided to um, co-found a venture philanthropy organization, which is um, quite the rage these days, but I'm sure she, she got in early on, um, called the Giving Circle. Um, so she can also talk about how to use whatever little extra time you have um, to further your interests that, that often, I think, segue into what it is you're doing professionally. Um, next to her, we have um, Andrew Harrison. Uh, she's the Deputy Legal Advisor for the Washington Delegation of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross does much more than most people um, are familiar with, and so I know I'm eager to hear about the, the very work that they do and how it is that she got there. Uh, her work with them has taken her also to working in Europe. Um, she worked in the headquarters in Geneva as the legal advisor to operations for the Near and Middle East and also Central and Southern Africa, and uh, was the legal attache to the legal division in Geneva as well. Uh, to her right, we have Oster Kimball, who also has an um, interesting experience both in the public and private sector. She, um, she also began her career at a law firm and then moved from there um, to go work. Uh, actually, you worked at a law firm and at uh, Goldman Sachs, so you yep. did two different versions of... Um, I often see them as uh, flip sides of the same coin. Um, <laughs> And uh, after that, she went to go work in the government. She was the um, deputy director of the Office of Cabinet Affairs in the White House and uh, finished off as deputy general counsel to Vice President Biden um, for several years before starting in a relatively new position um, as the senior advisor to the president and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, often known as OPIC, which she can tell you more about. Their work is also fascinating. Um, and last but certainly not least, we've been trying to get Cindy on the panel for a while now, um, is Cindy Dyer. Uh, she's vice president for human rights at Vital Voices, which is an NGO. Um, that works on identifying, training, and empowering women throughout the world and really has their, um, their feet on the ground in countries all over the world working with women who are changing the way that their countries work and changing the way that women can, um, can flourish all over the world. It's, um, it's a really strong organization which I encourage you all to get involved in. Um, before that, she was the director of the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, of specifically their Office on Violence Against Women. Um, and she clearly has a passion for um, issues of 
of uh, violence against women and uh, the struggles that they often face. She has specialized before that in um, domestic and sexual violence as a prosecutor for 13 years, in addition to also in her spare time volunteering on a domestic abuse hotline. Um, so hopefully today you'll get a very varied perspective. Um, they'll each speak for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then most importantly we'll open up to some Q&A, and please feel free to ask the smallest and largest questions that you have on your mind. This is your chance, and they're more than eager to answer them. Um, and then uh, we'll open up to um, some networking and private conversation at the end. So without further ado, I'll just uh, go right down the line and um, start with Jessica. I thought Cindy was going to go first. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for your interest in being here and for responding to this kind of discreet opportunity to talk about international law, especially women in networking. Um, let me put my glasses on so I can actually read what I wrote. So, in my experience, I've had I've worked for over 20 years on international issues, as um, we were just talking earlier about. Well, from law firm experience, I worked for Skadden Arps initially, then I worked for the International Labor Organization for many years, came back to D.C. on a staff exchange for the World Bank. Uh, for the last six years, up until June, I was the head of uh, government relations and international operations for ResCare, which is a human services company. And then in June, I joined Blue Star, which is a, a boutique international government relations firm. Now, how I got to Blue Star, I'm going to weave into my points for this morning that are kind of lessons learned and maybe some practical tips to help you kind of navigate your way through the international, international law. So first of all, um, my advice really comes from a mix of sweat and perseverance and patience, <laughs> um, from school of hard knocks, from being open to opportunities and risks that you might not think are going to turn out in the way you expect it, and really, frankly, good luck. So um, keeping yourself open-minded as opportunities present themselves is also part of the mix as you kind of, again, navigate your international career. So let me start with a first of three lessons that I think um, really have helped shape my career so far, and then the, the practical steps um, following those three lessons. So first of all, ask yourself, I mean, you're obviously here for a reason, but why do you want to work on international matters, and specifically substantive international law? International law is obviously an umbrella, but there are discrete areas within international law that you can focus on. So I would say lesson number one is take stock. Take a stock of your own personal experiences and inventory. Do you have a foreign language? Is there some substantive law that you've already been practicing that really captures your interest? Is there a parent or a loved one from another country that makes you want to work in another country or for issues related to that country? Um, can you recall an international experience that made you feel really proud of yourself that you were involved in somehow shaping, shaping the outcome? So really that kind of personal inventory is you know, looking at what passion you bring to working internationally and that's going to help give you that sense of your own personal unique inventory. Um, for me, this, this may sound a little bit, um, well, it's from my own experience. So I wanted to be involved in international law since I was in fourth grade. Um, we, I grew up just outside of New York City in a uh, suburb called Chappaqua. We took a class school trip to the United Nations headquarters one day. And I, to this day, I still remember getting off the bus, going into the UN General Assembly building, and being so struck by all the interpreters that were ringing the, the, the amphitheater. They were shrouded in their booths and they were talking. And I picked up the dial and it was Arabic, Chinese, G German, French. I was so amazed that there was a place like the United Nations where people from all over the world could come and be heard and have a forum. So that struck me in such a way that that idealism has never left me. So the chance to then later on work for the, in the UN system you know, was really a, a life privilege. And so when I think back on my own career, that idealism propelled me to attend Georgetown University. Then I studied international law at American University. Then I went to Geneva to work for the ILO. And then I studied international business in Barcelona and so forth. So my career actually has been a hybrid of international law and business. But I think about some of those early experiences that really impacted me and how has that shaped, um, kept my focus on wanting to work internationally. So lesson one is do your personal inventory and, and really look within to find something that moves you. you know, otherwise, you wouldn't be here this morning. So lesson number two, imagine your career as a series of stepping stones. You know, I think of the, the Roman god Janus, where two faces, one face looking back and one face looking forward. At every inflection point in your career, look back and look forward and see, your career may look linear when you're looking back, but at the same time, when you look forward, you don't know. It's kind of 
there's, there's a lot, lot of paths you could potentially take. But I always have found that your attitude is more important than your aptitude. If you have an attitude to learn, you will learn the skills along the way if, if that's something that, that matters. So at this point, when you're thinking about your career as a stepping stone, how did I get to where I am now? Where do I see myself? For example, have a three to five year flexible plan. Nothing ever works out as you, as you <laughs> detail it on the map. So keep that plan in mind and keep, help to keep you focused on what you're doing now. And especially when you're doing a job that is not your dream job. We, we all have them, we've all had them. So remember, my mom used to say this to me, this too shall pass and do a really good job at what you're doing now. Really good job at what you're doing now and let people know that you're interested in doing something internationally. So, um, <laughs> So disappointments will take you just as, as off, will take strike you just as often as unexpected joy, and neither lasts for very long. So just remember that as you're as you're stepping along, you know, do do what you're doing well now. For me, one of a personal kind of setback in a way or or disappointment was I had been hired to join Res Cares International Group to lead their their uh, practice going into other countries, and I also um, was able to build some contracts for them. We'd won $90 million in the UK, et cetera. So I was very excited about this. Then the company was bought out and they sold off International. <laughs> so I, for the last almost three years, I've been working on US domestic issues, state and local issues for ResCare. And I was doing, trying to learn the most I could out of this experience, but it was really, did not want to lose sight of international work. So I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, but, um, and this is how I got to Blue Star. But just remember that where you begin your career is not where you're going to end up. And by doing the best job you can, where you are, letting people know that you have inter interests internationally, you'll be surprised at the opportunities that do open up because people will know you for your professionalism, for the quality of your work, and they will recommend you to others. So lesson two, think of these stepping stones, do the best where you are, and paraphrasing a Chinese philosopher, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And then third, be a person of integrity. Think of your reputation and your integrity as your own currency. Protect your name by doing good work, show humility, deal honestly with others, and know how to be both a leader and a follower. If you find your day job is not as fulfilling as you'd like, volunteer your legal services in another area, a community organization whose mission you care about, and especially that has an international dimension. And if you're in school, internships are invaluable as a way to build your experience and your network. I mean, in fact, I have a few Blue Star plants here this morning that are here as interns. Thank you for being here. Um, and so basically, the, the essence of the, being a person of integrity is build your, build your own reputation, your own stock, your own currency. And remember that it doesn't happen overnight, but your reputation can also be ruined in an instant. So especially in international circles, you'd be surprised at how small the world really is. So be, have your reputation be stellar. So, those are the first the three lessons, but then just some, some simple ideas of how to do it. Um, read The Economist, <laughs> build, and that helps build your awareness and stay current, and don't feel guilty if you don't finish every issue. <laughs> um, but but I, I have found that, honestly, that's a really good way to kind of stay abreast and, you know, bite-sized nuggets in some cases to just what's going on. Um, and also just a little word to the, to, to the wise, beware that some of the jobs posted in there are already spoken for. So you may already know that, but that was a, that's a cold, hard fact to learn if, um, if you really have your eyes set on something that you see advertised there. The, the agencies are legally obligated to promote those jobs publicly, so maybe somebody is already doing that job. And if you can find somebody on the inside to really vet whether that's a real opportunity or not, that's going to save you a lot of tar time, heartache, and also help set your expectations. Secondly, I would say sign up for email alerts on the career section of organizations where you want to work and keep your profile up to date. So for example, the World Bank, the IFC, International Monetary Fund, all have really nice uh, tailored websites that you can post your, your profile on and they send you emails automatically that match your job uh, interests. So again, see, once you see something that you like, check to see if you can, if it's, if it's really an opening. And also, just be encouraged that there are jobs out there that really interest you. I mean, that's also part of it. International law is not, it's not a cookie cutter opportunity. So the more tailored you are, sometimes you find that the opportunities are fewer and far between, but don't lose hope. And then thirdly, I would say, add value to your skills professionally by adding or expanding your interests. You know, in addition to volunteering, I would say join or niche organizations like the Women's Foreign Policy Group, which hosts timely and, uh, events and lectures here in DC. Connect with others through LinkedIn, your alumni association, law school career office. 
Um, there are subscriptions like the, the ladders, for example, that again can help you tailor your interests to get your, your job search out there and your resume posted. And then practice your language skills, especially for Americans. Having another language is, is absolutely vital. I, I personally need to continue to work on my French, but that was something that I didn't realize until later on. Um, sign up for, for newsletters at embassies of the countries that you like or where you potentially would like to work someday. Attend their receptions. And keep in touch with people who you meet along the way in a meaningful way. I thought net network does not have to be forced. It shouldn't be forced because people feel like that's not, and not sincere. So, you know, talk to the person sitting next to you. Here's a perfect opportunity. This is a nice, discreet forum. And, you know, kind of build your own com comfort and getting to know people along the way. And this all adds up to opportunities. And then uh, fourth and final point on this kind of basket of, of skills to develop is mentoring. I was actually really surprised to, to see this, but this is something that I have found in my own career. Um, mentoring really comes in three circles, I found. Um, and especially for women, it's not, it doesn't seem to be as, we're not as comfortable maneuvering in mentoring, I think, as some of our male counterparts are. So I would say first, find a mentor, someone who you trust, admire, and with whom you can totally be yourself with. People are, are flattered to be asked to be a mentor, and as long as it's not a big time commitment, they, they're happy to do it. You know, have coffee, have lunch from time to time, exchange email updates, and then ask your mentor to help you be on the lookout for job opportunities. They'll know, they have their own networks, and they'll, um, they'll be able to help you know, shape something that is really right for you. So uh, for me, right now, having joined Blue Star, I'm working for two of my mentors who I've known for 10 years. And I've been working with them after Rescare sold off the International for the last three years, I was, you know, interviewing and I had some other opportunities, but just wasn't really, didn't really resonate with me. So after 10 years of working with them, I now am their general counsel. First time they've had a general counsel. So I say patience. <laughs> um, and so they did the very thing for me that I'm encouraging you to do now. You know, share job openings with your mentor or have them do the same, you know, and network with them, talk about pros and cons of your interests and help them shape what you're looking for and and you'll, be, you'll really be in good, good stead. So in addition to finding a mentor, be a mentor to yourself. When I was talking about adding your own skills, keep your skills fresh, learn new things that will expose you to different insights and different people. Um, for me, after 10 years in law school, I found myself doing a lot of international business, and so I decided to go back to school while I was working full-time in Geneva, and I was accepted to the University of Chicago, their MBA program in Barcelona. So um, <laughs> that was 10 years ago when I graduated, and I think, I can't, met, believe that I managed to work full time and do the program in 20 months, but I did, and 10 years later I'm really, really, I, I reflect on what I learned there, I, I still apply it in my job, and also I made really wonderful friends. So that's another thing that can I kind of, you know, differentiate your, your career by doing other skills. And then thirdly, mentor somebody else. Give back. Especially if you're going through a career tr transition yourself, being able to share your experience and look out for someone else is incredibly rewarding. Um, you may even find it builds your own confidence in validating your prior experiences. So with all three circles in motion, have a mentor, mentoring yourself, and mentoring somebody else, the possibilities for opportunities really do abound. So let me just close by, by saying, you know, recapping, stay open-minded, take stock of your own inventory, think of your career as stepping stones, build your integrity, stay connected, mentor, and dream big while you're doing the job that you have now. So. I'll just close, this is one of my favorite quotes, and I really find this, this helps, especially with international work. It's from a French Quaker minister in the 18th century. I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness I can show to any fellow human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Thank you. Um, so, and thank you, Jessica. I wish I had someone giving me all that great advice when I was uh, going through my own, uh, my own process of getting into international law. I know for me, it was, I, I tend to find, have a talent for finding the hardest way to do everything. And so, um, I, and you can see from my bio, so I won't go over everything again, but just, I did international studies in undergrad, loved international, but had only a vague idea of what I could do with that as a career. 
Uh, and my counselor just kept telling me, go to law school, go to law school. I was like, I don't really want to, but I did it. Um, and I, of course, picked the one law school that had like the least amount of international law <laughs> <laughs> options. And I, no, I mean, the career services had no idea what I was talking about when I said I want to work abroad. And, um, so I really, I really struggled, but I started doing study abroad during the summer. Um, and that, that helped me like, retain my interest in international law, but I really did struggle um, getting towards the end of law school with what I was going to do, because I still could not find opportunities. I just, I really just had no idea where to look, um, who to talk to. I was working for a DUI attorney at the time, and uh, doing some family law clinics, but still completely unrelated to international <laughs> law. Um, and a, a, a mentor of sorts at my law school, he was on his, I think, third career, just decided to do law school after, after many other careers. Um, really encouraged me to do one more year of school, which I really also did not want to do because I just do it. Go get an LLM in international law. If that's what you really think you want to do, just try it. Um, and so I applied, but then I went back to Texas to take the bar and to work for a while. Um, after I had applied, just waiting to see what would happen. Um, and the week that my the law firm I was working for, a family law firm, told me that because of the financial crisis, they weren't able to hire anyone for the next two years was the week I got an acceptance letter to this LLM program. So I was like, well, this must be a sign. Um, so I told my parents I was going to be doing another year of school, and I was moving to Geneva. And they were very supportive, thankfully. Um, but I wasn't even sure if this was the right decision. It was going to be, again, another, another year of school, another year putting off my career. Um, but I, I knew I really was interested in these issues, and so I, I decided to go for it. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful. I went. I picked a program that I thought was human rights and refugee law. I was um, telling uh, somebody this earlier, and it ended up being um, law of armed conflict. I got to the first day of class, and it said humanitarian law, but I didn't know what that was. And they're talking about POWs and, and other things, and I really had no idea what I got myself into. Um, I ended up loving it. Uh, I. The professors were all practitioners who had practiced uh, armed conflict either with the International Committee of the Red Cross um, or with other organizations, the UN, um, Human Rights Watch, various organizations. Um, so they weren't just academics, they really had been on the field, had been in combat zones for many, many years of their career. And I, I just, I really couldn't have found something more perfect for me. I would never have imagined that the idea of military law uh, doesn't necessarily get my blood flowing, but it actually ended up being something I really enjoyed practicing. So I was recruited directly into the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. So I worked there for two years, and then I've, I've been here a year. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the organization and what I do here, just um, so that y'all have an idea of, of opportunities that are out there um, that you might not be aware of. Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross is an organization, uh, neutral, impartial, and independent, uh, that works primarily in, in areas of armed conflict and other situations of violence. And this can vary from context to context what the organization is doing. Um, but typically, our, our primary purpose is to monitor compliance with international humanitarian law, so the law of armed conflict, um, and to also work on prevention issues, so training the military, uh, training the civil, civil society on the principles of uh, humanitarian law and also human rights law and refugee law to some extent. And uh, in, in this context, it can, can be a right, wide range of of what that might mean, but for example, in a conflict like Afghanistan, you would have people on the ground uh, providing assistance, medical care to the civilian population, um, but also looking for what might be violations or abuses on the ground. So if there's a <laughs> reports of a large number of civilians being targeted or a lot of civilian objects being destroyed in a certain context, we would, I don't want to use the word investigate because uh, I'll, I'll talk about our approach in a moment, but we would look into these things and then uh, see if we do see what we would think would be violations of international humanitarian law, and then we would go to the authorities. And the, the ICRC works in a, in a confidential bilateral way. So everything that we do on the ground, uh, we work with the parties of the conflict, so either the state or non-state actors, um, and that could be quite a wide range of actors if you think about Afghanistan and, and the people that we would be talking to um, in southern Afghanistan or for southern Yemen or somewhere in the DRC, we can be talking to some very interesting <laughs> groups. Um, and this is, but this is really what the ICRC's mandate is. It's to work with all sides of the conflict um, and to provide assistance to all sides of the conflict as far as medical care and, and whatever other assistance might be necessary. Um, but again, we just engage in, in confidential representations, encouraging compliance, providing recommendations um, for parties to be able to improve um, how they're behaving, because obviously in, in armed conflict everything is pretty, it's, 
it's never a good thing if you're in the situation of war, but it can hopefully be better. Um, and so that's really what we're what the ICRC's mission is. Um, here in the U.S., uh, we we have a small office here in in D.C. and our main goal is to liaise with the U.S. government on issues of military operations, compliance with international law, uh, various other topics. So for my position here in D.C., uh, I cover detention and weapons treaties and a few other random things. Um, for <laughs> for detention. Um, Obviously, that's going to be Guantanamo and third country nationals in Afghanistan primarily, but also captures that might happen in relation to the, the global fight against terrorism. Um, so one of the ICRC's long-standing practices is to visit detainees in armed conflict, and we've been doing that since before World War I and World War II. Uh, of course, in those wars, it was quite clear who you're visiting, POWs or civilian internees. Um, these days, it's a little more complicated when you have all these non-international conflict with insurgent groups, you're not really sure who's a civilian and who's a, a fighter, as it may be, but uh, we, we, we are working also to develop um, good practices um, and visiting detainees uh, in these sort of, I don't say newer conflicts, but, it, but not the traditional conflict. Um, so we regularly visit Guantanamo every few months, um, and we've been doing that since 2002. And we have a team in Kabul who also visits uh, detainees there. And so we, here in D.C., often Afghanistan will call us and say, look, there's an issue with this detainee. Can you talk to Washington? Um, whereas Guantanamo, we have direct contact, so we, we sort of do it ourselves. Um, so this is one of the kind of big things that I follow. And it can, can be, a, as a lawyer, a, a variety of things, what I might be doing um, in Guantanamo. It's going to be more of the military commissions or the periodic review boards, the hopefully forthcoming periodic review boards, mm -hmm. um, which have not started yet. And, or a hunger strikes, I mean, it can be a wide range. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, well, there's two deputies in the office, he covers things more like conflict of hostilities, cyber warfare, so we sort of split the files. Um, and then, again, it just what's happening in the field is what's going to be our day-to-day job um, and it can really change. Last year I did a whole lot of things on the Kimberley process for instance, which I probably will never do again. That's a uh, conflict diamonds. But it just happened to be because the US was the chair of the Kimberley process last year. Um, so it can really uh, vary what I do on a, on a daily basis, but for the most part it's attention and then like I said, weapons treaties. And with weapons treaties, uh, the ICRC is, does a little bit different. It's not the confidential bilateral dialogue that we, we normally engage in. It's more of acting as expert counsel on how humanitarian law can be incorporated in an international treaty. Um, so what I do with weapons is quite different. Uh, it's a lot more advocacy-based, I suppose. It's still not quite advocacy, but it's more public, I would say, whereas what I do with the tension and other issues is going to be very much calling up the State Department, calling up the Pentagon, asking if I can have a meeting to talk about a specific issue, whatever that issue is. Um, so as Jessica was saying, networking becomes extremely important. Um, because people don't answer the phone um, if they're busy, unless they know you. And so you really have to work on that. And that's something I would have never imagined doing. I really thought networking sounded like the worst thing in the world. Um, but I've actually found that it's, it is. It's a, it's a talent you develop, and it's something that's true. You, you have to learn how to network in the sense that if you're just networking for networking's sake, you're never going to get anywhere. But if you're actually connecting with people you like, or you know who's working on it, even if you don't like them, if you know they have an important <laughs> issue and you're willing to invest, um, you find that networking is not as, as miserable as it may sound. And some people just naturally love to network, so that's, that's good for you. I wish, <laughs> I wish I had had that and it didn't take so much practice. But uh, anyway, so um, I have to say I have, I'm one of the very lucky people where I started a job that I absolutely love, that uh, fits my my skill set, but also my, my personality, I think. I, I feel like I work better. Uh, the things I liked in law school, which were working with clients in the clinics, um, and uh, there's a few other things I liked in law school, but not, not too many. Um, <laughs> and, and generally, just being able to, to strategize on issues rather than, I, I can't say I was the best researcher. I think I found a job that I could do what I'm good, I was good at in like, the domestic skill set or in law school skill set I was able to translate into international law. And I think that's really the tricky thing um, in international law, is finding what would translate. What did you do here? What are you good at here? That you could find that you're good at in international law. Uh, 
but not everyone would be great for the ICRC. I have to say, it can be extremely frustrating if you want to be an advocate and you love being vocal about everything and denouncing everything that you think is wrong. Uh, you would just go crazy. Uh, you just so much of what we see and what we have to talk about, we don't get to say to anyone. Um, we can't write about it. We can't. Uh, we we can't even if it's some. I mean, this is within reason, but with some horrible tragedy we witnessed on the field, we can't go to the ICC and report it. Uh, we have to work incrementally with the authorities and with the parties who are committing violations. Um, and even if you can only see a little bit of change at a time, that has to be enough for you. Um, whereas there are other organizations, obviously, like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, where you would be able to be much more vocal. Um, it's, it's really a matter of finding what, what are you wanting to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think people would be surprised to know that I probably spend 25% of my time writing minutes of meetings that maybe two people in Geneva read. And so you, you have to be willing to take kind of the bad with the good as well. Um, and knowing if, if you really love your job, you'll in any ways be willing to do those kind of things. But uh, you, it, it might take some, some moving around. Again, I, I've kind of started off in a, in a career I really liked, but I think, I mean, I did a lot of internships in, in law school and, and in my LLM where I was just miserable because it was all day at a desk, looking at research, doing citations, and, and I just didn't enjoy that. Um, and so I think if you really think about what you like doing in, as a student or as an intern or whatever job you're in now, um, you can usually, if you ask enough questions of, of people who are inside an organization, you can kind of find out what their day to day life is like, and I think you can get a good idea of whether you would really like to work for an organization or not. Because again, you, you can have this idealism of what, what you're going to be doing, and how you're going to be saving the world, and whatever. And you might be, but you might really be hating saving the world every day, because you just can't stand writing minutes of meetings. And so, I mean, and it's just something you really have to, to think through, um, and, and take stock of, as Jessica said. So, um, I think I will end it there, though, if at the end, I have a f I brought a few things on working for the ICRC, but really, like, if you were not ready to apply, I only brought three, so <laughs> just uh, be, be kind to your other uh, colleagues. All right, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, whenever I do these talks or talk to people about careers, my first advice is always go to law school, so you're already uh, on the right track. Um, my name is Astrid Kimball. I'm currently at OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is a tiny government agency. It's the U.S. government's development bank. We're part of the executive branch. We actually make money for the Treasury every year, which is an important <laughs> talking point in Washington these days. Um, we are a foreign policy agency that supports U.S. private sector investment in emerging markets, so everywhere from Afghanistan to Chile to Haiti, uh, Egypt, we're trying to get investors to go to Egypt now, which is hard, um, and uh, all to support U.S. foreign policy priorities. We were created after the Marshall Plan um, and as a political risk insurance um, tool, and now have expanded our products to financing and investment funds, um, and were designed to support the U.S. private sector going into these countries. And, um, the role of the private sector and the public sector and how they interact is something that I'm passionate about and something that I think that lawyers play a unique role in uh, in how both public and private goals can converge to tackle the world's problems. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, I came to OPIC recently about six months ago. This is sort of a dream deferred. I took a job in the Obama campaign, um, took a 20-month leave of absence from my law firm because I really was passionate about America's role in the world. Um, and felt very strongly about his candidacy and um, and then ended up doing two years of a similar kind of, I resonated with what you said, to get to an international, to get to foreign policy, I had to live in Iowa, New Hampshire, um, <laughs> South Carolina, 11 states, um, leave my international dispute resolution practice at O'Melveny to go slug it out in the, in, for 20 months and, um, and then ended up, we won, which was um, very surprising. And then we, um, and when I joined 20 months earlier, um, went to the transition and to the White House for four years, um, where I was in an office called Cabinet Affairs, which coordinates policy with the executive branch agencies um, with the White House, and then really wanted to go back to practicing law um, and went to be uh, Vice President Biden's Deputy General Counsel, which was really interesting to have the in-house counsel experience compared to being at a firm. Uh, there are a lot of 
pros and cons of both, which would be interesting to discuss. Um, but I just wanted to say a couple things about sort of what I've, uh, my experience, um, that echo some of what uh, the others have said. Um, the first is that doing a good job at, at whatever your task you're given is more important than any kind of networking um, or um, uh, sort of career planning you can do. I mean, you just, it's very unpredictable, particularly in politics when your fate depends on an election, <laughs> but um, it's very hard to sort of plan that. Um, but that, there's a saying in Washington, your intern will end up being your boss one day, and I think it's <laughs> absolutely true. You have, I think this is true in law, I think it's true in politics. You have no idea who on, on a conference call you're working on, an event, on a brief, on a, um, a policy issue, what meetings you're, I mean, everyone pops up again. It's amazing. And, um, and really the people that you work for, the people that work for you, your peers. Um, how I got my job in the White House, I was... Um, a lawyer who's a bit overqualified at the age of 30 to be on a presidential campaign. I mean, there's a range of skills, but um, which goes to another point, which I really like what you said, sort of having the long view because you sort of have to sidestep. Um, and I was on the campaign. We were a week before the New Hampshire primary in January 2008. Obama had just won Iowa, um, and. Uh, it was the state of New Hampshire was flooded with the volunteers and the chief of staff for Obama's Senate office came up to volunteer for the last couple weeks and he and I were in charge together because of the, right before an election that there's no high thinking to do there's just getting out the vote and it's very it's sort of like manual labor and um, Chris <laughs> Liu came up to um, volunteer and he and I were in charge of bands together which is actually really important because every election campaigns lose bands all over the state and um and so they have to get returned so he and i worked on bands together and um this happens all the time and um so he and i were in charge of the vans making sure that the 20 vans the campaign had rented got back to the rental shop and we worked really closely together um stayed in touch really close touch um and we just did a really good job on vans and, um, <laughs> And he and I just got really close, and we just. And then when he, he got nominated to a very high position in the White House, and um, and ran the transition for Obama and hired me. And I mean, I think that is something I could never have predicted that that job, which would would lead to a White House job. And so I think the general point of doing a good job at whatever it is you're doing is really really important. And I think the most the strongest relationships come from working with people. Um, and getting through a thorny problem or answering a pressing query together or figuring out how to do an event together. Um, and so I think that's just important and everyone also shows up again. Um, I think another thing is, um, we talked a little bit about mentoring. I, I was thinking about this before today about how actually some of my most important mentoring has been through peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. My network of women, my women, mostly women, my age, um, or, my, or a couple years older or younger who um, are in similar paths in their career, and that's how I've gotten jobs, 100% um, how I've gotten jobs, I and mean, more than I mean, just someone knowing an opening's coming and calling me who's my peer, and I think men do it all the time, and we need to do it, um, really look out for each other, and that's why events like this are uh, so important. I also think that, um, so knowing yourself, I, this is, I want to reiterate that because I think it's something that's really important, knowing what you're good at, what you enjoy, what gets you, doesn't feel like work, what feels like something that just is natural to you. And you don't always get to do what you're good at and what you like, but knowing that is really important. Um, and, and then also taking risk. I mean, I was very passionate about Obama and took this leave of I was very lucky I took a leave of absence and got when I got hired on the campaign so I had a job to go back to and but um, so it wasn't that much of a risk but but it uh, was a big disruption to my life and it was um, I, I think you know you can't plan this but that jumping jumping for something that just drives you is um, is also really important so look forward to our discussion and it's great to be here thanks <laughs>
I am, I'm a little bit different in that I did not set out to do international law. I didn't even know that, that such a thing existed. I'm pretty sure that was not offered in 1985 at Texas A&M University. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, I totally snuck in the back door like a stray cat. I'm telling you, they left the door ajar and in I went. Um, I started out, I wanted to be a prosecutor and I wanted to work on um, violence against women. That's really what my passion was. I went, I got a job at the Right out of law school, I went into the district attorney's office, and they didn't have, back in those days, a specialized uh, violence against women uh, office. And so I did what everybody else did, you know, burglary of a coin-operated machine, urinating in public, things that make you want to get out of bed in the morning, wrap yourself up in a flag, and give your closing argument. So, um, but I did claw and claw my way to felony prosecutor where I was doing murder cases and robbery cases and these really were the things you went to law school for, right? And so my friend who was my mentor, she of course, her husband was the district attorney of the neighboring county. So they were friends with our district attorney in Dallas County. I'm not from here. Um, <laughs> so her, they, she said, listen, I've stolen one of the drug court prosecutor spots and we're going to do a family violence division and you should be the prosecutor because I know you love those cases because I see those have the place of prominence on your desk. The DWIs and the aggravated robberies are in the drawer, but the violence against women, rapes, they're on the top of the desk. And I said, you know, let's do it. And so we, I left my, I had clawed my way up to felony court and then I left to do all the domestic violence cases, which by the way, are number one, the, most of them are misdemeanors, and these also can be classified as all the cases that nobody else wanted to try. So I went this, and then I heard things like, oh my God, you have thrown your career away. Or the always popular, who did you piss off? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I want to do this. And they, I remember my friend said, Cindy, you went to law school, you're a great prosecutor, and great prosecutors, they prosecute murder cases. And I said, you know, Actually, a good prosecutor prosecutes a murder case. A great prosecutor prevents a murder case. And that is done by aggressively prosecuting these misdemeanor domestic violence cases and child abuse cases before they become murders. And so thing number one is you gotta have some big ovaries, okay? You gotta have big ovaries to do what you think is right and do what you love. Because here was the thing, worst case scenario, maybe I was throwing my career away, but I was gonna love every moment of it. Because because these cases made me want to get up in the morning. So I did these cases and then right about this time, so I became a specialized violence against women prosecutor, as long as there's an Eckerd's I'll always be a blonde, in September <laughs> of 1994. So I loved these cases and right about this time a little thing called VAWA passed and I thought I need some money. I, so I started figuring out how to write grants, and we actually got one of the very first grants. And so I was able to bring in a few. I didn't even have to steal them from drug court. I got money to bring in people. And so I started growing this kind of big division. And I, here is tip number two, don't be a jerk. I was nice, you know, I was pleasant. I was nice to everybody because, as my smart friend over here says, they could be your boss one day. You know, plus it's just the right thing to do. So people <laughs> wanted to come to the Family Violence Division, and it sort of became, then this whole OJ thing happened. You know, <laughs> it became a big deal, and I was sort of sitting pretty. And it was completely because I did what I wanted to do. I really did. Um, and I also, because I was one of the first people that was a specialized prosecutor, I started traveling around training other people how to do these crimes. It is possible to try these cases. Um, now, it wasn't easy. I fought with judges. The judges didn't, they liked the status quo. Because if they did, if, you know, if I dismissed that case, they're disposed, their stats go up, and they are on the golf course by 2 o'clock. But if you try one of these hateful cases with all sorts of medical evidence and all sorts of family court files, it's a hard. And they would tell me, Cindy, don't you and your husband fight? And I said, well, Your Honor, we fight, but he has never tried to smother me with a pillow the way that this guy did, or beat me in the head with a claw hammer. And then I would get these kernels of wisdom from Texas judges, no lie, Judge Bubba King. I swear you can't make that. <laughs> and he said to me, 
Well, Cindy, there are different classes of people in this world. And some people, you know, that's just how they take care of their problem. That is not even the least of the things that I heard. So I fought the system. It was not easy. And sometimes they called my boss, can't you do something with her, you know? Um, I, tr I started, you know, I need, to have, I need to have the police on board. So I started kind of organizing the people in my community. I started working at a shelter for battered women for nine years, one night a week. I answered the hotline and helped the women with their legal options. And I loved my job. I loved my job. I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. Um, and I, I really did. I also started working on legislation because I saw, as a prosecutor, I saw the flaws. It wasn't like, you should do this from the top down. It was like, if I change this, it would be easier for me to put him under the jail. It was just totally made sense. So I started working on legislation and I was doing the speaking, and then about this time I'm like, you know, I'm ready, I want to have some kids. So I had kids, and I have been a prosecutor for almost 10 years at this point. And I walked into my boss's office, the district attorney, and I would go campaign for him, you know. I said, listen, I'm here with good news. I am not going to quit, but I'm going to work half time. He said, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Half time. Half time. In fact, I used to joke with him. I would bring him, like, I'd make a loaf of bread and I'd bring him half. And I'd say, half is better than nothing. You know? And, uh, and so we had this little joke going. And he said, you can work half time if you just don't quit. So I stayed as the chief of the Violence Against Women unit. When it, by now, the largest unit in the district attorney's office, because we had misdemeanor division, we, we established a specialized court. We established specialized uh, protective orders. And I worked half time, and I loved my job, and I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. And then it's politics, and a new district attorney came in. And he did not get rid of me because I, did I mention I wrote the grants that paid for half of my staff. I'm like, yeah, bring it on, you know. <laughs> but we did not have, we did not see eye to eye. He was a longtime defense attorney and owned his own bail bonds company, which he thought qualified him to be the district attorney of Dallas County, you know. And so I thought, what am I going to do? Well, about this time, I got a call. Hey, you know what? You know, you've done a lot of stuff on VAWA. You've worked on legislation. You've been training all over the U.S. Would you come and be the director of the Office on Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice? Well, I'm like, I've got two kids and a husband who's an attorney, but big ovaries, folks. Big <laughs> ovaries. I decided, well, this is clearly not working, not working for the defense attorney. So I thought, I'll do it. I'll do it for two years. Well, it'll be a it'll be a fun adventure. I have a lesson number two: marry a good, marry well, find a good <laughs> partner. When I say well, I don't mean wealthy. In fact, my husband jokes that we 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 only dated that we each married the poorest person the other that we ever dated, but someone supportive. Someone who will support you and say you can do it and you should do it and they're damn lucky to have you. That's what I mean when I say, you know, have a good partner. Um, and so we made this crazy move, brought the two kids out here. My husband flew back and forth and I was at the Department of Justice and I thought, I am the luckiest girl in the world. I love this job. And I had actually done the work. You know, I didn't, you know, I, I thought this is great. I love this. And then I started doing international work and I realized... I had a lot to offer women in other countries because I had fought the good fight in, you know, back rooms of Dallas with Judge Bubba. <laughs> so, the offer, so when it was time to leave the Department of Justice, I, I had a friend of mine was the U.S. Attorney in Dallas, and he said, come be a U.S. Attorney, and I thought, I could do that. I could totally do that. Or maybe I'm not too old to learn a new trick. Maybe I will do this, this international thing that I thought was so interesting. And so we talked about it with... Remember, what was lesson number? I don't know what. Have a good partner. My husband said, you've got to do it. It's a great opportunity. Let's just do it. Let big ovaries marry well. No matter what you do, it all comes back to this. So I, I decided I didn't go become a U.S. attorney. I did. I went to work at Vital Voices. And I'll tell you that I all of a sudden had this crisis of confidence. I mean, I had spent 15 years slugging it out in the courtroom. I was fast on my feet. But I was having this crisis of confidence because I was with all these smart people who had gone to these great law schools and who had done international law, and they mentioned things like Kimberly something something, <laughs> and I didn't know what they're talking about. And I'm like, oh my god. But then I started thinking, you know what? I got some street cred. I got some street cred because I know what it's like to 
change the law. I know what it's like to work at a shelter and figure out how am I going to get enough money to put clean sheets on the bed. I know what it's like to figure out how do you get judges to do what you want them to do. How do you bring the police officers to the table? I knew this and so I find myself, I'm working with women all over the world who are actually very similar to me. I am actually more helpful to them than if I had gone to some really fancy, you know, school. I'm really helpful. So I think that another thing is, you know, talk about what you know. Play to your strengths. Each of you has strengths. My strengths is not you know, I hadn't studied this stuff, but I can learn fast. I'm fast on my street, fast on my feet, and I have these experiences which are really helpful. Um, and I do think that for me, like I said, um, I did. I worked part time. Um, I worked part time, half time, 20 hours a week for six years, and it's I, it didn't it didn't tank my career. I'm doing okay. You know, this whole thing it worked out for me. Um, but I think that you can do what you love. But whether it be a focus on something that maybe other people don't think is really uh, popular, but if it's what you love and it makes you want to get up in the morning, it's worth it. You can also do what you love in the sense of you can focus on kids for a while. I always kept my foot in the door, but I also spent a lot more time with my kids than some other people had the opportunity to do. But I think that that's one of the benefits of waiting till you had, because if I had my kids at 28 or 30, they wouldn't have let me work part-time, but by the time I had my kids, I was valuable. And so they, I was able to negotiate a much better deal. Um, and the other thing is take, as, as, as they said, take, uh, uh, take, you have to have courage to kind of take, take a leap of faith. You know, move to the big city of, D, of D.C. when you're really from, you know, Cameron, Texas. Um, <laughs> it really, you have to take that leap of faith. And if you're doing something that you love... Even if it doesn't work out for you in that you don't get tons of money or promoted, at least you're doing what you love and you, get, you look forward to getting up every morning. Um, so I think, uh, the other thing is like, I do think it's a good idea. I, like I said, I worked in the U.S. and I kind of got some street cred here and I have found that it does translate. Not everything translates, but a lot of it does. And so getting some street cred and getting some real experience here can help you when you're working overseas, in my opinion. So thanks, I look forward to answering any questions that you have. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I heard some, I mean all of us heard the same themes uh, cropping up again and again. Um, international law, when, when people ask me what I do at Cocktail Party, they say I, I work in international law. And anyone who works in international law means knows that means nothing. What does that mean? And, uh, you can see that people come from all different angles towards international law and one of the resonating themes was Figure out exactly what is your passion, you know, within international law. And sometimes that takes domestic tones, and sometimes that takes international tones. But as long as it's the same theme, there may be less opportunities coming along because you are more specialized. But when they do come, you're better suited and uh, and better prepared to take on that opportunity. Um, another theme was that you might also along the way have to do things that aren't the sexiest. <laughs> um, but uh, I've found for me that whenever I've failed and I think I'm so upset because I wanted to do A and I ended up in B, B actually was what put me on the right path that I never would have gone on my, on my own. And then another theme was everyone shows up again. So this was something I learned late that actually networking, uh, as important as elder mentors are, uh, equally important are your peers and you know when you come here to this event it's just as important to network with the person next to you than the people up here because they will show up again um, and that means having lunches not only with you know people who are established but I remember Osri went on a lunch campaign when she was looking to do the the transition she lunched with all of her peers and said, here's what I'm, I'm interested in. Tell me about what you do. Tell me about the worlds that you know about. And I wanted to plug, uh, Wes was plugging the, um, ASIL comp the annual ASIL conference. I think for those trying to figure out what it is you're interested in, what the opportunities are, that's a really great way to see the spectrum of uh, different shades that international law comes in and the different specialties that exist out there. Um, and uh, the other theme that I heard was, uh, well, less of a theme, but more, I guess something that resonated with me, was there's a formal process and there's an informal process for everything. And you've got to play the formal game, but 
always assume there's something going on informally to get you that job and, and go for it. And that's where the networking and the perseverance comes in. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, open it up to some questions and answers. Um, if anyone, just raise your hand and... Hello. Um, thank you so much for speaking this morning. Um, I know there are many people in here who are looking for jobs and it's very competitive right now, especially in the international law. Um, what would you say would be um, the one thing that an applicant can do to make themselves stand out from everyone else? I don't, you know, I'm not really even, uh, I'm not like at a law firm, but I'll tell you what I'm looking for it when, because I do have, we post something and we get tons of so smart, passionate women, so very impressive, and it is really hard. So honestly, what I'm looking for, I am actually fairly risk averse. So one thing that I'm looking for is if I can hire someone who has interned for my organization, who I've had a chance to check out, who I can make sure that this is someone who's not only willing to like um, help me research something, but also willing to run make a copy for me without giving me the hairy eyeball, that's the person that I'm gonna hire. So honestly, interning, if you have a place that you would like to work, go and intern it. I did this myself, and I was not one of these kids that like, could have had parents that supported me when I interned for free 99 free 99 um, in, in my first job I then worked at a department store selling you know clothes in the afternoon to pay the bills but I think people are gonna hire what they know so all else being pretty equal if there's somebody that's worked for me or that has interned then I'm gonna go with them yeah, I would also, I would add, I mean, interning at the organization, I agree with that. And then um, also, if you have the capacity to have, uh, to do a fellowship or something on the ground, if you want to work, I mean, there's having the, and that's something I'm looking back, wish I sort of spent more time abroad, actually. I think that that is a really invaluable um, tool in your toolbox that you can pull out later. Um, that, so I know that's, a, if you want to go to a firm, that's hard to, to do, to sort of sidestep, but I think, and also the languages piece, I think, is really, I mean, I also, I think, in, um, it's always a tension to sort of being a generalist and being a specialist and having, um, so that you're open to many things, but having something that you know really well, and I think having something you know really well, whether that's by living abroad or doing a fellowship in a very discreet legal issue, um, you, you can pop up again and open a lot of doors. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, the other thing that, that I know a lot of people have done with our organization that's worked really well is if sometimes there's not an internship, there's not an opportunity to actually work for the organization, but we'll have students call us all the time for an informational interview, and I give those quite frequently. And I've met people in informational interviews, and when we have had something open, um, an internship at RMB, I, I call and say, do you want to submit your... CV and so like they're in already in my, my my view and so I think that's that's one way too is if there's not something formal that you can apply for also just like if you know you really like the organization just calling up whoever a lawyer that's there um, even if you don't know them I get emails all the time like completely I have no idea how they got my contact information but I still say yes so um, I meet in a public place but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's I mean, that's one way to do it, too, to kind of get, get on the radar of an organization if there's not something formal open. Um, and then, yeah, with, like, when I'm hiring interns, I also, again, if, if you're in an organization, especially an international organization, even the UN, to be honest, is this way, they don't have the HR resources like a private company might have, and so they're going to use a lot of shortcuts. So, yes, either you already know someone in there, or they'll have a computer program that literally will just pick out the, the keywords in your, your resume. Um, or they will just look really for a very specific thing, like you need to already have a degree in, I mean, in my case would be humanitarian law, or you did a competition in that subject, or something where they can immediately see the exact phrase they're looking for, um, because they don't have the time to, to necessarily invest in training you from the beginning, so. I would just echo the informational interview part, or find out if there's an event where somebody from the organization is speaking, kind of similar to this, where it's a, an informal way of seeing whether you connect with that person and um, and it does the way to stand out is by having the background having the experience and by showing some persistence the first the first job you apply for may not be the one that you get 
So, you know, kind of echoing all the other panelists. Next question. Hi, thank you all so much for coming. This has been very helpful. Um, my name is Katherine Cooper, and I'm a 3L, and I think um, kind of a related question a lot of us are looking for the first or second um, stepping stone. And I'm just wondering if um, you can speak a little bit more to um, how to look for that first job with um, maybe the fourth or fifth stone in mind. Um, for example, uh, Cindy, what were you thinking when you were you know, getting the first job prosecuting um, public urination? Um, <laughs> or versus Andrea, you, weren't, you, you decided, I just really need to jump and get the LLM to get directly into international law. So for those of us who really want to work in international law, um, how, to, how to have that longer vision of, of the job we might have in 10 years. Thank you. Um, well, for me, I think that, I, I, and this was, this was echoed by, by Jessica and others, but I do think that take, I, I was the one that, like, I, I'm kind of a planner, and so I picked an organization that was big enough to withstand and could tolerate some upward movement. Like, my, uh, it, it, Vital Voices, I, it's a wonderful organization, but it's pretty small, and so you have to really be tenacious and hang on a long time in order to move up because you don't move up until somebody else moves out. And with a small organization, there's just not that as much opportunity. So there is something to be said for going with a slightly larger organization because, number one, they're going to have a bigger hiring pool. And number two, bigger organizations, you have more of a chance to move up. Now, I will say that with a small organization like mine, you end up, you don't move up, but you do the work of the higher person because there's nobody else around. Um, and so that has its benefits, but I know frequently I'll have women, some of them are in the work, in, uh, well, they'll do amazing things, but in order to move up, they have to move out because it is small. And so that's the one thing I would be mindful of. They each have their advantages, but if you're really kind of wanting to be able to accelerate, like at the DA's office, you came in, it's a big operation. And so you can move up pretty quickly. I just wanted to add one thing, sorry, but um, I think if you have the opportunity starting a career at a law firm, I mean, really so glad I did that. And I, I think um, law firms do things very well. They have um, resources and so just it gives you a sort of quality, your touching stone for your work product your, is your standards are so high. And um, I have come back to the law firm experience a lot in terms of, um, just, it's also just sort of a credibility thing, I think, in the legal profession that I, and they do a lot of things. If you, so if you don't, if you want to get in in one way and then do international law later, um, I, I would really, if you have that opportunity, really encourage you. I, I would probably just say the same thing as, uh, as Austria as far as t getting as much experience with kind of the mundane things. I, I found that actually, especially when I got into international law, internationally when I was in Geneva, um, I was a hot commodity for the fact that like I'd done client billing or <laughs> that I knew how to make a filing system, which I had done when I was working for a DUI attorney or for a family law attorney. Like, I mean, in the States, I think we have a, a really great advantage there is that you normally work all the way through undergrad, through, through law school, and I would put those boring things on my resume. I know I got my first job in Geneva, which was like an internship while I was in school, and I was actually too old for the, I was, I was 26 and you had to be like 25 or under for the internship, but they called me because they were starting a new office in Geneva, and like you're the only person with office experience. So I didn't want any of my international skills, any of my, anything that, you know, I was working so hard to get, they, they knew I had, yeah, done really boring secretarial kind of work, and that was what uh, they were looking for. So, I mean, I think you don't, yeah, so you might not actually be able to plan what, what that's going to lead to, but I think just getting, making sure you have like that broad school skills, either at a law firm or, or wherever you want to practice that. Um, and the other thing, like as a general thing for getting jobs um, in the international field, you kind of know, I really want to do refugee law, so it's going to be the UNHCR one day, but like you're just having trouble to get in. Um, one thing that, that I think most of my friends ended up getting into these big organizations by starting out on the field, so they would find a small NGO in Uganda or something, uh, they'd go volunteer for six months or whatever it might be, um, and that would lead to, also because a lot of these NGOs are contracted out by the UN, so you would actually end up working for the UN, but just for some other small NGO by name, and they would once pay you far less than UN people get paid, but uh, <laughs> that, that was how, again, I mean, it depends on what exactly internationally, and that doesn't necessarily work in the business model, maybe, but uh, for, for human rights and that type of thing, I think that's another good way. And I would just close by, don't forget about your professors. Right. They're there to teach. They love 
to impart their knowledge, but they also have ideas for you as well, if you have a particular sub sub subject matter. I studied international environmental law, and I'm actually still in touch with my professors, but it wasn't kind of a, it just by the natural course of my career, I've kind of stayed in touch in different iterations with them. And so they will also be able to look out, especially while you're in school, if there's a, an opportunity to do a clinic, to be on a journal, write a piece, anything that would, again, demonstrate that you're developing a breadth of skills, and that might help shape where you're going to go three or four steps. Uh, several of the panelists have plugged interning and volunteering, so I just want to plug that there are many opportunities to volunteer and intern at ASIL, <laughs> and also um, in the Women in International Law Interest Group. Uh, they've also plugged mentorships, and as uh, Wes told you about at the beginning, this is the first year, our inaugural year, of the uh, Willig Mentorship Program, which we're going to uh, have a particularly strong presence in Washington. So please fill out the forms and leave them at the um, front desk downstairs as you leave if you're interested in joining. Um, so next question. Um, I have a, a quick question. How do you, uh, for those of us that are experienced um, international um, lawyers, um, how do you address a situation? I think um, Cindy mentioned that she worked part time, 20 hours a week. Um, how do we overcome any possible challenges in transitioning from uh, part time to full time? How do you address those kinds of questions, especially for those of us that have kids and have very good um, references and, you know, where, you know, in terms of competence, we worked very hard and we have good resumes and standard backgrounds and then we face um, some, you know, uh, hairy questions and in interviews concerning, with all that, how did you end up, you know, taking this time off to take care of your kids? How have you... If, um, addressing, I think Cindy mentioned that, um, how do you address that? And then um, the next question, that just a, a quick one. Um, did you, any of you face any peculiar um, experiences that were unique to your being women in, uh, working in international law? And uh, how do you, did you address that? Uh, um, thinking in terms of any um, challenges, you know, turning your challenges into opportunities. Uh, if, um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, I can start on the second part of your question, which was about unique challenges. And just, um, you know, just be sensitive to the context where you, if you have an opportunity to work. And so one example for me was when I was in the Middle East, I was representing our organization in Dubai. And I was the head of the office, and so the fact that I was Western, American, I was able to have access to some of the other women colleagues that if I had been a man, I would not have interacted with. So in a way, the minister that we were dealing with was a woman. She'd been educated in the United States. And uh, she, had this, she had a great sense of humor, by the way. She was like, why do you Americans keep exporting Babe Watch? And the colleague was like, no, it's not Babe Watch. It's Babe Watch. She said, I don't know. It just, it's something that's not good for women. <laughs> But anyway, so I just, I recognize at first, you know, it is off-putting when you're in a new context in a different country where you may not, you know, you know have all the resources available, but in this case, it ended up being a positive. So uh, my first watchword is always just kind of listen and observe and, and see what's going on around you, um, and you can maybe convert that into something that's positive. I mean, on the second point, I've definitely seen it be an advantage and, and a challenge. I mean, I felt more, I think, um, law, I felt law school, actually, I felt the, um, was, was the first time in my life, actually, that I felt this sort of gender division in the classroom and felt like, wow, this is really a hard, a hard field for women to get their voices heard. I mean, I think my, it's a balance between um, my natural inclination is to be humble and self-deprecating and it makes people feel comfortable and that's my style. Um, and I've, as I've come into OPIC at a fairly senior level with people who've been project finance bankers and lawyers for 30 years and they are looking at me with, I don't have a ton of experience in that particular field, not to sort of push that part of my personality aside and not, and not say, oh, I don't know anything about this, you know everything, tell me, and I mean, not pretend I know everything about it, but to find, sort of swallow, not let myself say that stuff, that, uh, and because, um, 
and sort of build myself up. Um, but it's a struggle, actually, I think. And I think in certain parts of the world, it's, and I found doing, that we're doing a lot of business with the Asian Development Bank, I found it hard for me to be the senior person representing the agency in the meeting because of sort of, I look young and I'm a woman, but um, you just have to push through it and find um, other women to support you. And also, I think picking your bosses and this, I, I haven't taken time off to have kids, so I can't speak to that, but I think picking, part of why I went to work for Biden, actually, is because he values family so much and he values, um, and all of us have family stuff, whether it's kids or not, um, and picking your boss and someone who shares your values and you know, wants you to work hard, but also prioritize your, your life, whatever that is. Um, and that's hard to know on the front end. Uh, but doing a lot of homework on that, I think, is so important. So, um, at, at the DA's office, we actually had a word for, we called it getting little ladied. I would say, I believe he just little ladied me. Because I would get things yeah. like, um, uh, li little lady or ma'am. And I wanted to turn and say, yes, pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I feel like, and that was hard, especially, I mean, this was, I mean, I worked at the DA's office back, I was the first woman to wear pants to the Dallas County District Attorney's Office, and it was in December of 1993, mark it in your calendar. Um, and I bought a skirt on a hanger just in case I got sent home. Um, and I did not, and now I would like you to know that you can wear pants at the Dallas County DA's office for the greatest of ease. Um, so I do think that you have to be, you have to be, better than the men. You have to be, I mean, I, I, I mastered what this facade. I would be terrified and nervous inside, but on the outside, I was calm, and I had literally, I would grab my arms, or I would hold on to something so that I didn't shake, because you have to have the appearance of calm, even when you are furious, terrified, you got to fake it, fake it. Um, and so I got good at faking it. Um, so that thing, that, and then the other thing, with regard to going back in, I actually had the opposite problem. I, uh, with, well, with my first job working part-time, it was good. I didn't feel, they weren't trying to pull me back in more than I wanted to go. But when I came to D.C., they are. And I think that it's been harder. I don't even work part-time anymore. I just work full-time now. <laughs> but even then, I think that there is a pull for you to stay late. And, well, I put in my time staying late. I just did it in Dallas, and so it kind of doesn't count up here. But I think that, like, going back into the workforce, people are afraid that you're not going to be able to travel and that I'm going to have to travel because you can't because you have kids. And so I think that in order to get back in, you've got to convince the person that you're, you want to come back. You've taken your time off, thank you very much, and now you're ready to go back gangbusters. Because they, I think that the hesitance that you may feel is they're afraid of hiring somebody who's used to staying at home with the kids and they know in their head, and I'm expecting you to work 70 hours a week and travel one week a month. And so you've got to... You, on the one hand, you've got to convince them you're willing to do it, but also I would advise you don't sign up for something that you're not then willing to do because that's where I'm right now. I'm trying to, I've got too much travel coming up, and I'm trying to find a way to not travel so much because I've got kids, but I don't want to put it off on my younger colleagues that don't. But I think that you've got to overcome that fear that, you're, that that employer has of I'm going to end up doing it because you're not going to want to. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Mariana, and I actually just graduated from college, so this is very early for me for this. And um, I have got so I've been applying to some internships here in Maria, um, and I've gotten this question a lot, which is, so why are you passionate about this particular human rights issue? And I'm just trying to figure out the balance between having a compelling interest in something um, that's narrow, either thematic or regional, but also being really open. So in navigating that question, I'm always like, well, I, um, I just want to do something helpful and meaningful, uh, but then at the same time, I know they're looking for something specific from me. Um, so what advice would you give in striking that balance? I would just say, just be honest. Why, why do you have that passion? 
what is, is there something that's been in your experience and your family, something that is really true to who you are? Because right from the get-go, wherever organization you work, you need to try to be as honest with who you are as possible. So, you know, you can say, this interests me, but I'm open to this. But just something that shows that it's, it's authentic. And especially in international circles, um, we, you know, we've, we've referenced the language issue before. But I actually found that um, when I moved to Geneva for the first time, I had studied German, Latin, um, a little bit of Russian, I mean, rent, you know. And so I'm in French-speaking country. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, I'm thinking, I'm hearing French, I'm thinking a little bit of broken German. But I found that my observational skills really mattered, and I could suss out who was BSing in a heartbeat. <laughs> because I didn't know what the language was, but I could tell there are certain gestures, you know, when somebody's not looking at you, they're fidgeting, or, uh, so, um, I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> being authentic, being authentic. <laughs> so, so that's, that's to the point, and you know, you can become a really good eavesdropper um, when you live in another country, when you don't know the language. <laughs> Um, I would agree. I, I know when I went to do my LLM, um, I had a lot of students in the program with me who had their hearts set on like one particular, maybe it was working for the ICRC, they wanted to be an ICRC delegate, there was nothing else they were willing to accept. And I think that's just not the attitude to go with. You can be really passionate about a certain organization or about a topic, um, but you have to realize that you're probably going to have a lot of steps along the way. So it's one thing to say, you know, I really one day, in an interview even, I really one day want to work for the ICRC, um, so I'm just using this as an example of but more for anyone. Um, but uh, you know, but I really also am really wanting to get certain skills, and that's why I'm interested in your organization right now. And I, I don't think people are offended by that. If you're not saying, you know, if you're interviewing for I don't know the government, and, and you're just saying, well, I, I don't want to always be a government lawyer. I, I want to one day do something in human rights. I don't think. Uh, employers think that's a bad thing. I think they like knowing that you are really passionate about something. Um, and they understand that you're going to work for them maybe for a period of time and then move on. I don't think that's, that's necessarily a problem. Um, they like to see passion. Uh, but you as a, an individual have to be open to, to getting jobs and maybe not your, your dream job right away. Like you, you have to take those, those steps and maybe the less exciting jobs for less exciting organizations um, just to get that experience. Next question? Hi, my name is Jean Choi, and thank you so much for uh, your talk. It's, it's really great to hear the various perspe perspectives. Uh, my question is, right now um, I'm practicing investment arbitration, and I think in a lot of um, practice areas, once you practice the substance, even under the umbrella of you know, international law, it can be quite specific what you practice and what kind of skills you are, learn. And you know, just from your experience of you know moving around between private sector to public sector or different organizations, how how you transfer uh, your you know kind of expertise and skills, especially when when the substance area or your you know your experience and value can be very specific, and how you even um, how you even learn of different opportunities where your skills or, you know, legal experience can be transferable. I, I think it's a really Im important point that um, you're, first of all, to take the long view on your career and sort of that you're going to have different times when you're, the skill set you're learning is different. Um, so, for example, for me, the last six years really between the campaign and four in the, <laughs> four in the White House were a ton of political and process. Um, education, actually, a political education, I would call it, um, that uh, I think um, were just a skill set that really beefed up part of my skill set. I felt like why I wanted to go to OPIC, a more narrow focus, was that I really wanted to beef up the substantive piece. And I, a mentor of mine actually told me, um, uh, in your career, you sort of layer in substance and process. And I think both are incredibly important to get ahead. You can be, you can know detainee issues and be the smartest lawyer in the room and yeah, but if you're not sort of, if you don't know how to get ahead in your organization or get find out what's happening in the world, um, you're just, it's not, I use you as an example, but any sort of narrow issue, you have to have both skills. So I think um, at a law firm or at a, going out of your, 
comfort zone. It could be you know running the summer committee or um, uh, running the softball team or running the women's group or organizing and getting sort of different skills in your bucket of skills is is really important and both make you a better professional and lawyer. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that when you're kind of you're oversaturated in one skill set and want a different experience at that. So that for me, the white leaving the White House after four years, I was sort of ready for a non-sexy sort of non. Uh, more in the weeds reading type job than a lot of <laughs> exciting meetings. Uh, so that's, um, but that uh, that idea of the layers of your career made a lot of sense to me. So, and then I would just also once you find an opportunity you're interested in, learn the language of the new organization. And I know, like for example, going between the nonprofit and the private sector, there are people want to go either way. But they're using things like you know EBITDA or return on investment or whatever if you've been in the private sector. And for an NGO, that might not resonate. But they also know that they have a budget and they've been granted a certain amount of money and they have deliverables, et cetera. So once you've gotten that, really, you can say the language that you're used to, figure out what those terms are to make yourself credible for that new organization. And there aren't that. There are a lot of terms that really do cross back and forth. So then that shows you've done your homework and that you're articulate in the new world that you're trying to enter. Something that just occurred to me working at a law firm, uh, I interview a lot of candidates, and um, I'm throwing this out there because it just occurred to me, but um, one thing that could be useful is ask the people that you're interviewing with, why are you looking for someone to fill this position? Because then they'll tell you what the problem is, what the gap is in the firm that they're looking to fill, and then you can tell them how your experience would fit that gap. And unless you ask that specific question, you're not going to know why you're in that room. And, and they're not going to tell you what gap they're looking to fill. Another way to say that question, too, is sort of what would it take to be successful in this job? Or just outright ask, what qualities are you looking for in this person? Is it sort of judgment? Is it process skills? Is it? But I think that's a really good, and you can and have your sort of set of answers that you can fit into that. And just um, just to add on, uh, I know I, I come from a field that tends to be over-specialized so that it can be really difficult to transition. Um, even in the human rights law, to be honest, like you become very, very focused. Um, and the people I know, my, my predecessors and ones who, who have gone on before me and I've seen other organizations, um, they got their jobs really because of the networks they made. So they might, they've transitioned to the private law firms, they've transitioned into disarmament, whatever it is they've done, and it's, they've had no background <laughs> in that. But they made contacts along the way really well, and those people knew how well they did their job, and they were willing to take a risk that they'll learn the new specialty um, because they've, they've just seen how good they've done at the specialty that they did have. So, and I would say if they ask you, well, just because you're really good at whatever such the thing you do, I mean, how do you know you're going to be good at this? I would say, well, the reason that I'm good at this. The reason I am so successful at this really specialty is because I am, and then you list the things that make, I, 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 I learn quickly, or I'm fast on my feet, I'm a good public speaker, I'm a good writer, I'm good with budgets, I'm good with numbers, whatever it is that has made you good at that, take it back to what are the skill sets that you have, and because you're good at this, this goes to show you that I can be good at anything else too because I have these skills, which is what made me so good at this. I would back it up one step. And uh, we'll take one or two more questions. Maybe we'll group two questions together. Um, hi, my name is Sue. Thanks for uh, speaking to us today. I'm new to the area. I just moved here three weeks ago. I made the leap of faith to move here because I want to work at an international NGO. But I spent the last 10 years as a family law attorney with solo practice. So speak, talk about specialized skills and trying to transfer. But my, my question is really a simple one. One of my biggest regrets is that I don't have a second language, so I need to learn a second language. Which language should I learn? <laughs> French? I'm thinking French or maybe Spanish. What do you think? If you want to work in human rights and that type of thing, I would probably go for French, especially if you ever think you'll circulate through the UN system um, or, or something that's connected to the UN system, like the ILO or. ICRC, we, we do almost everything in French, which is why they have to specify that I'm a U.S. citizen. Accent is very vague, I guess. Um, but then, to be honest, if you were going to get into something more like trafficking or something you're going to be working out of D.C., I would say Spanish, yeah. It really depends.
depends on, on, on what you on what field you want to work in. I mean, it, it could be really extremely useful to work in to learn Farsi. Um, you know, if if you're focusing on on women's issues or or the Middle East, you know, so yeah. you really first have to figure out what it is you're aiming for before you do the language. You can't go at it from low language first. Okay. Okay. And I'd actually throw in, there is not all languages are equally easy to learn. Um, <laughs> there is a hierarchy. In fact, the, the U.S. government has an online ranking system of the ease of language and the number of hours it takes to get proficient in that language for their purposes. So you can check that out. If you, I forget what the official title is, but it's um, it's a ease of learning index or something like that. So you know, be aware of the fact that learning Spanish is a whole lot different than learning Russian. It's a whole lot different than learning key Swahili. So there's there's a lot that goes into that. And uh, last question. So having spoken with other attorneys practicing in, in human rights law areas, violence against women, um, I've heard a lot of discussion about how it can be disheartening uh, sometimes to go in every day and realize that the rapist conviction rate is 4% in certain areas. Or, um, and I was so happy to hear that both of you seem to love your job so much. So I'm wondering what has allowed you to, to get up and really feel like the luckiest girl in the world um, in the face of sometimes disheartening statistics and, and scenarios? I, I, uh, okay, well for me, and I, and I did, I mean I was a line prosecutor for almost 15 years, um, and I still do it now, and there are times when I am truly depressed. And I do not read sad books, I do not see sad movies, because I'm like, why would I pay for that? I can just go to work. <laughs> pay ten dollars, I'm gonna come out of that place happy as a clam. Um, but I think the thing for me is that, uh, the reason, the thing that keeps me going is that I do see progress. I do see success. And in fact, when I've gone for a period of time without success, that's when I start thinking, oh, I could go drink margaritas by the pool, you know? Um, but uh, I think that because I see success occasionally, now, success, look, success looks different for me. Success was easy at the DA's office. You would get a conviction, you would put a guy behind bars and you would, that is clearly easy a success. The success I see now comes in, I work with a country and they passed a law which they didn't have before which actually prohibits and criminalizes the trafficking of adults. I work with a country, I work with police officers and they send me an email that said I want you to know I just rescued 98 kids. You know, I, this, these are actual things that I got, you know, within the past six months. Um, we we work with them like you have changed my life you have changed yeah, i'm going to go advocate you know you get these things you they may be every once in a while but you do get little things that make you that are little success stories and you begin to see progress that is what keeps me going and i don't have to have them every day i don't have to have them every week but i do have to see them once in a while and that's what keeps me going uh, and my daughter thinks that i'm saving the world <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Cindy and I are also both from Dallas. Maybe that's uh, maybe oh, it. And Karen's in the uh, <laughs> Texan blood to be positive about everything. Um, I would agree with everything she said. Um, I, I would maybe just add that it's it's good to have sort of side projects as well. So, I mean, within your within your professional career, but that that are not like your day to day. Like, if I had to think about the 166 and the 66 detainees, the 166 in Guantanamo, the 66 and background, like, these are the individuals that are, like, haunting my, my daily existence. Um, but what I can do on the side that I really, really enjoy is teaching. So I do a lot of, like, uh, lecturing at universities, just for professor friends or whatever, just, just as a side thing. And I, I'm always inspired by the students and their enthusiasm and their idealism. And I remember, like, why I got into what I'm doing. And I think just having that kind of getting out of work thing, and it can be a volunteer thing, it can be whatever would, would be appropriate for or whatever you're passionate about. Um, and for me, I love teaching, so that, that kind of helps me, again, if I'm having a really bad day or just like a really slow day of work where just nothing is moving on my files, then that, that's something I always look forward to. Um, so I would say that. And let me just add with, um, the ILO is the oldest of the specialized UN agencies. It's been around since 1919, so it actually predates the, the UN. And there's kind of an internal saying there that it's like an old ship. But, and it's going to take a long time to course correct. But when it starts to move, there's an amazing ripple effect among other organizations. So the, um, I'll give an example that's very important to the United States, the, the trafficking in persons work the State Department does. 
And so being able to be involved in projects where, for example, the U.S. every June puts out its report on what's going on in other countries where the U.S. has been giving money related to trafficking persons. And they, they rank the countries. And so to be able to say, if you're part of a big U.N. agency, you know it's going to move slowly, but you're being part of something that actually is almost like entrepreneurial and moving, then you can see that the results of your labors are actually multiplied in other ways. So it's kind of... Like, to your point about doing something that you feel personally is going to keep you motivated, but then realize it does happen. And when these things, when these organizations move, it's really exciting. You think, oh my goodness, all these countries have signed on to a treaty that is going to affect maternal care, that's going to affect uh, labor rights in the workplace in Bangladesh, for example. Things that it just, you start to have to see where, where the, the, depth, the dots connect, and you'll find that that kind of keeps you going. So in closing, I would like to offer that when all else fails, find a motto. Find a motto <laughs> to push you forward when things are hard, and find a motto to help you make the right decisions when there are a lot of diff gray, uh, gray answers where there's no clear right or wrong. So I'd like to offer up three, and I honestly refer to a couple of these almost on a daily basis. Um, one is you don't get what you don't ask for. Uh, another way of saying that is ask the worst they can say is no. Um, and uh, the last one I'll offer up, and maybe I'll just turn it back quickly in case there are any other great mottos on the panel, <coughs> is find a way or make one. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of making of ways uh, that we heard about today. I, 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 have a, I, I actually, you know, there is no situation that does not have an appropriate, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King quote. My personal one is, that when he said, the greatest tragedy of our time is not the evil deeds of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. So I wake up every day saying, well, I don't know what I'm going to be, but it's not silent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um,